Take a look at this. What you just saw was a smoke explosion. And for those that have been watching the channel for a little while, will probably be aware that smoke can be quite flammable. But for those that are new to the channel, we'll go back over the basics. Because when you heat a solid fuel, for instance, in this case, the wax of the candle, that wax will then change in its states of matter, becoming a liquid and then eventually a gas. And this gas is then released into the air where it can mix with oxygen and go through a chemical chain reaction that emits light and heat that we know as fire. Now, if we put this candle out, what we will see is that the smoke that was previously being burnt in the flame is now released as a small smoke column. And if we apply a match to that smoke column, you can see that the flame very quickly travels back down through that smoke column and reignites the candle. And so this just demonstrates on a small scale that smoke can be very flammable. But we can actually apply this all the way through to full-size fires in the real world. Because as you can see here, the smoke is venting out of the building and mixing with the air as it reaches the outside. Now, as it reaches the outside and mixes with the air, a flammable mixture can be made, and then it can be ignited from the heat inside the building. And this is basically the same concept as our candle and it demonstrates that smoke can be flammable. Now, I say can be quite flammable because the chemical makeup of smoke really is quite complicated. But if we have a look at it in a really simplified way, take our candle, for example. The candle is made of paraffin wax, which is a hydrocarbon. Now, this means that it is made of hydrogen and carbon. Now, we're going to overlook the specific amounts of them right now and just look at the reactions themselves because when we oxidize carbon in the self-sustaining chemical reaction that is fire, it can either be fully oxidized or partially oxidized. If it's fully oxidized, the carbon becomes carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide is not flammable. In fact, we use it as a fire extinguisher now, if the carbon is only partially oxidized, then we get carbon monoxide. And carbon monoxide is very flammable. And in fact, it has a flammability range of around about 12 to 75%, which is a very wide flammability range and demonstrates just how flammable this gas really is. But that's not the only part of the picture because the carbon can also combine with the hydrogen to form products like benzene or formaldehyde. And it's also possible that the carbon isn't oxidized at all, and we will simply see enough carbon particles joined together to form very small particles of smoke that we refer to as particulate matter. Now this is concentrated on the carbon so far, but what about the hydrogen? Well, hopefully you would know that if we fully oxidize hydrogen, we end up with H2O or water. And what may come as a surprise is the fact that hydrogen is in most fuels that we encounter. And therefore, water is actually a byproduct of almost all fires that firefighters encounter. And so now, if we're thinking about the chemical makeup of the smoke, we know that we're likely to have some flammable products like carbon monoxide and formaldehyde. But we're also going to have some non-flammable products like water and carbon dioxide. And so the flammability of the smoke is going to be based on the relative concentrations of these different substances. And when we're looking at smoke, that's almost impossible to determine because Smoke will vary greatly depending on the combustion process, whether it is oxygen rich or oxygen deficient, whether it's high temperatures or low temperatures, and a whole range of other factors will come into play that will determine what byproducts we're going to see in the smoke. And so with all this in mind, fire ground determination of whether a smoke is flammable or not is almost impossible because it can't just be done by looking at it or by its color or density really light-coloured smoke 
can be flammable. Really dark coloured smoke can be flammable. Thick smoke or thin smoke can also be flammable. So there's no way of determining on the fire ground whether or not it's flammable because it really comes down to what the chemical makeup is and what kind of combustion was happening as it was being released. But if we get back to talking about smoke explosions, which, by the way, can also be known as fire gas ignitions or fire gas explosions, and I've tended to use fire gas ignition in a lot of the training that I've conducted over the years, but in doing some background reading for this video, uh, this book here has been calling them smoke explosions, and this is, if you know much about fire dynamics, a, uh, a, a pretty reliable text. So I'm sticking with smoke explosion for the day. Um, getting back to talking about smoke explosions, they are different to backdraft, which is also a explosion, um, which is very different to a flashover, which is a transition. So backdrafts and smoke explosions are often mistaken for each other. And when you look at a clip like what we've just seen, it would actually be really easy to mistake one for the other. And I'm gonna play some videos later, which I think are smoke explosions, but they could have been backdrafts. It's just that I'm armchair experting it and only have a clip that I found on the internet. It's, it's a little bit too hard to be absolutely sure, but the actual setups, the actual events are different to each other because if we have a look at a backdraft, what we have is a room that is filled with very rich smoke. There is not much oxygen in there at all. And so what that's waiting for is an opening to be made into that room so oxygen can be drawn in and smoke can be pushed out. And when this occurs, a flammable mixture can be made in the room. When that flammable mixture is finally made in the room, it is ignited by either an ember or some of the heat that is still in that room. When this ignites, you get a rapid expansion of those gases, which then pushes out the rest of the fuel-rich gases through that original opening. And when this fuel-rich smoke gets pushed out of the door, it finds more oxygen where it can then ignite. And so that's the process of backdraft. We start off with a very, very fuel-rich environment. And this will also most likely occur from the fire room itself. Whereas smoke explosions will often happen in rooms that are adjacent to the fire room. And if you have a look at our first example, you can see that this looks like it's occurred in the attic or the roof space of the building. And so if we think about a fire burning somewhere in the living space of that building and the smoke being channeled into that roof space area, then we just need to think about the fire triangle because it was likely that there was no fire burning in that roof space. So the oxygen that was originally there is still there. And all we've done is added the fuel rich smoke. So if we think about the fire triangle, we had oxygen, we've added fuel, now we just need an ignition source. And this can come from the fire itself. And so essentially what's happening is we have a room that is filled with oxygen and fuel, and it just needs an ignition source to ignite that fuel. And when it ignites that fuel, we get a very rapid explosion. And in this case, it was enough to partially lift the roof off the building. And so this just goes to show that smoke can be very flammable and that smoke explosions can be a pretty significant hazard on the fire ground for firefighters to manage. And when you're thinking about signs of a potential smoke explosion, really all you're looking at is rooms that are filled with smoke and there's no real fire ground way of telling whether that smoke is gonna be within a flammable mixture or not. And this is one of the many reasons why I think gas cooling is such a powerful tool on the fire ground. Because whether it be a fog pattern or a straight stream, if you are delivering water into the smoke, then you can reduce the flammability of that smoke, not only by cooling things down by potentially hundreds of degrees, but also by diluting that fuel as well, which can act together to take that smoke below its flammability range, and therefore reduce the risk of a smoke explosion. All right, well, that's it for this one. Thank you very much for watching. If you've liked it, give it a like or drop a comment down below. Um, I'm gonna put my Instagram page, which is really underdeveloped, but it still exists, um, 
at the end of the video, so if you see any more cool clips you'd like me to talk about, just tag me in it and um, I'll have a look. Apart from that, yeah, thanks for watching. I'll uh, catch you in the next one. Cheers.